My friends, before we begin today, I have to let you know two disclaimers. First of all, all of the links, all of the sources I use in every one of my videos are in the description below. Don't take my word or anybody's word for it. Do your own research, please. Second of all, there are scammers with my name and my profile picture commenting in almost every one of my videos. I report them and they make their accounts faster than I can report them. It's, it's an algorithm, it's a Russian bot. It invites you to a Telegram channel and here's the disclaimer. I don't communicate to you with my Telegram channel. So if it's my name in my profile picture asking you to come to Telegram, it's a scam. Now my friends, let's zoom into Moscow once again. It's getting very repetitive, but this is the reality. Now this is the Mozhalsky region, Mozhalsky city part of Moscow, western part of Moscow as always. And you have three guesses what happened here last night. You guessed it, another drone attack. I'm not going to make the smoking carelessly meme, except somebody was smoking carelessly in western Moscow. Three Ukrainian drones flew into the area. Moscow mayor reports that two of them were shot down and the third drone, a drone gun was used, but it still crashed into a building. That's the Moscow mayor's version. The real version might be that they just couldn't shoot them down and kaboom happened, as you can see on this video. Ukraine could send 30 drones with one night. But that's not the goal. They want to drip them in one night at the time. I mean, this is what, the fourth night in a row where two to three drones are flying into Moscow? I mean, that rhymed. And I do agree with this strategy. One grand attack is not as effective as a small attack every night. This war has reached Moscow. They feel it every night. Windows are shattered, car alarms are going off, air defense not working. Ruble falling, they feel it. Now my friends, let's go to the front lines and one of the biggest things I want to show you is about two weeks ago when these Ukrainian bridge had over the Dnipro, the third one of Kozachki Lagieri right here was a very big deal. Still, I was talking about that Russia needs to do something about it. Well, now they have. They have actually sent reinforcements into the area. Look at this. This is the 1822nd Battalion. Not reinforcements, 205th separate motorized rifle brigade, this was here before. 126th separate guards coastal defense brigade, this was here before. 439th guards rocket artillery brigade, alright. But this, 7th airborne assault division. This one was sent here next to Oleshki, the biggest Russian occupied settlement closest to the biggest Ukrainian established bridgehead over the Dnipro. These are the Russian elite airborne forces, the Saintniks as they call them. Now these guys were sent here to put a stop to the expansion of the bridgehead or push them back. Time will tell how Russia will use these troops, but knowing how Russia uses their elite troops, they will be used as infantry, not as special forces as they are intended to be used. My prediction is that this division sent here will not have big effect on these bridgeheads and Russians are not able to dislodge the bridgeheads. They will expand slowly. Now my friends, let's go to the southern front and let's go to Robotina, this settlement right here. Yesterday a video came out about Ukrainians evacuating the residents living in Robotina. This has been a frontal settlement for about six months plus. So Ukrainian people living in this settlement have been under Russian occupation for a very, very long time, very close to the front line, very close to their own troops, hoping to be liberated. And it only now happened. And of course, immediately if Ukrainians liberated this territory, they started evacuating these people. So if any kind of Russian counterattack would be effective in the future, these people wouldn't fall again under the Russian occupation. Before we watch the video, I want to show you why Robotin and this very front here is incredibly important. These lines you see here are Russian trench lines, defensive lines that Russia has dug for six months plus prior to the Ukrainian June counteroffensive. We see that most of the southern front has two lines, the first defensive line and the second defensive line. And then some bigger cities like Tokmak and um, Kamyanka have circles around them. So these are important logistical hubs that have full protection around the settlement. Also Ocheretovate, this one right here. Why this front and Robotin is so important? Because it is the first area in the whole of southern front where Ukrainian forces have reached the first Russian defensive line. As you can see, the whole fight happens way before the defensive line. In no areas Ukrainian forces have penetrated deep enough 
to reach the defensive line. Well, here they have. This is why Ukrainians sent their elite, most best equipped brigade, the 82nd Brigade, into this area. The 82nd Brigade has Western Tech, United Kingdom's Challenger tanks, they have Strikers, they have Bradleys, and they were sent around Ropoitina. And this is in the context of reaching these first Russian defensive lines, which are supposed to be very tough to breach, time will tell. Also, when 82nd was pushed around Robotina, 47th Brigade was pushed directly inside of Robotina to evacuate the Ukrainian residents living in the settlement. So right now, let's watch a video of the evacuation process itself. 47th Brigade evacuation process. Video comes from Dimitri. Link is in the description below. This is a Bradley, United States Bradley. They're evacuating people, of course, inside armored vehicles to protect them. <laughs> As you can see, the pure joy and gratitude. I would like to see you. Not like this. Guys, thank you. We are very glad to see you. Call the daughter, all right? Hello, my little daughter. Hello. I love the fact that the phone is a Ukrainian-themed color. <laughs> it's so fitting. Hello, doll. Sweetie, they brought us out. Sweetie. We, I know, mom, I know. Don't cry, we're already safe, we're home now. Sashenka, how are you there? I think I'm okay. I think we'll see each other soon. Hello. Hello, my sunshine. How much we missed you? Uh, one thing about Slavic languages and Ukrainian and Russian and Polish, and these languages have a very... In, in English, my sunshine, you can say it, but you really don't say it so regularly. In, in Russian and in Ukrainian, it's like Solnuchka, and uh, Lyubime and uh, Lyubov, they just say my love and my sunshine and my sweetie and it's, it's everywhere, all the time. So it's one peculiarity of the Slavic languages which I really like and here you can also see it. We missed you too, we'll see each other soon. Psychologically, until there was no water and until there was no light, then there was no bread, we planted some vegetables in the garden, otherwise we would have to run between the gunfire. We dug up a little of potatoes that's what we ate. How old are you? I turned 52 in the summer. How did you celebrate your birthday? Let me tell you, I had a wonderful gift. I was gifted pies with mulberries, three loaves of bread. Mom brought a bouquet of roses and the godfather brought half a crate of bagels that he found from the occupiers. Well, we had hope that our people would come and everything would be fine. You know, we waited so long that today they came unexpectedly, which shows that the Ukrainian OPSEC is very good. Robotina was about to be liberated about a month, almost liberated, and then suddenly, bam, they're here and no warning. We couldn't even believe that they were ours. You're so brave, guys. We are very grateful, very grateful to the guys who stayed with us, covered us. We waited in the basement initially for our equipment to appear, for the miracle equipment to appear. Well, the main thing is we are going and we know that we are going to peace, going to Ukraine. I was waiting for the armed forces of Ukraine. Look, she has a cat also with her. You were waiting for the armed forces of Ukraine in Robotina? Well, what else? Where were you hiding there? Well, where would I at my house? Goodbye. Farewell. Can I pet her one more time? The cat saved it. And this emotion is so fierce and so sincere. You can see it in their eyes, in their language. Nobody wants to be under Russian occupation. If some people in the West have Russian sympathizers, and I can understand it, there's actually quite numerous group of people in the West who secretly or openly have Russian sympathies, they should watch these videos. They tend to be under Putin's media influence, which doesn't show stuff like this. They show the opposite. And if you, if you watch stuff like this, you kind of understand why nobody wants to be under the Russians. It's just like a, a disease a virus, they're colonialists. And every land they occupy, it's not about trying to build up the land or give them new medicine, new language or new culture as the Russians say themselves. It's actually about extracting the resources, making the people kind of into semi-slaves or serfs, as it has been under the Russian Tsardom all the time. It's extracting until the land is empty. I mean, this is how it was in the Soviet times with all of the Soviet republics. Everything goes to Moscow and to serve the Moscow's interest. Everything. Everything the land has. That's the reality of it. 24th of August is going to be the Ukraine's Independence Day. 24th, so that's tomorrow. 
1991, 24th of August, Ukraine got free from the Soviet Union. For Estonia, the same date was 20th of August. So four days was the distance. Estonia got free and four days later, Ukraine got free. The SSR was demolished. For tomorrow, Russia has already pushed more of their Black Sea fleet cruise and missile ships to the Black Sea. These ships carry Calibre missiles and they're ready to fire at some targets. Ukraine knows this and we have seen these ships move. What is interesting that Russia and Russian ministries have instructed a lot of their workers to work from home because a lot of the Russian ministry's offices are in the area of Moscow city district. That area has been one of the main targets for Ukrainian drones flying into Moscow again yesterday. So Russia knows that for 24th of August, Ukrainians want to surprise them and give them a proper welcome for the party, for the Priesnik. So they know that this Moscow city district ministry's offices are the target and they cannot cover them with air defense systems because they have not been able to. So they advise people to work from home for Ukrainian Independence Day, which shows directly the fierce influence of Ukrainian holidays to Moscow. Which already shows that Ukraine is not nothing to Moscow. It's not another small country where war is going on on the borderlands. It has a direct influence of how Moscowites work. Also, the head of Ukraine's military intelligence has promised a surprise in Crimea in the next days and I'm looking forward to it. My friends now will zoom into a certain settlement of Ukraine next to Romanian border Ismail. You can see it right here. It's connected to a river that flows into the Black Sea and this is part of Ukraine's corridor of exporting grain right now. Although Russia is not in the grain deal, Ukraine is still exporting grain through its ships and international ships through the Black Sea and the offloading and unloading happens in the Ismail port. Let's zoom into it. See the border of Ukraine and Romania. The closest Romanian big settlement is Tulcea right here. And I'll zoom into the grain facilities. This is Ismail Sea commercial port right here. These are the grain facilities and on the Google Maps photo you can actually see the ships also. I guess the photo was taken at the very right time. Now Russia attacked again this grain facility, this grain import infrastructure yesterday with Iranian Shahed drones. One of the drones connected to the target and on these photos you can see the destruction. With grain, unfortunately, if you hit a huge grain pile and there is fire and the roof caves in the grain, it's ruined, you cannot use it. There's debris in it, it's half burned, so it's quite easy to destroy food like that, quite easy to destroy a huge vast quantity of grain, a few tens of thousands of tons for example. And unfortunately the honest truth is that Ukraine does not have enough air defense systems to cover a settlement like this. They don't even have enough to cover other military objects like Russia. I mean they're both big countries and, and you cannot cover everything. You would need tens of thousands of air defense complexes for it. We're not talking even about the ammunition or radar systems. So unfortunately a successful Russian drone attack against Ukrainian grain infrastructure and there was a kaboom and the uh, grain was damaged, the food was destroyed. Now we have an interview coming from Dmitry, well, originally from War Gonzo, the Russian military blogger, interviewing two mobilized men who talk a minute about their story. And I want to share it with you, it's quite interesting. When I left Novo Sibirsk for the first time, I exhaled because people like us there and are treated with respect. Unlike in Moscow, which is very sad. Yes, if you're on Metro, people move away saying, you murderer. He's wearing his Russian military uniform with a Russian military flag in Novosibirsk, which is a far east Russian city. Unfortunately, where also Estonians were deported into that area under Stalin's time. My grandfather was deported into the area when he was four years old two weeks in a train. They come from that city and then they go to Moscow before going to Ukraine and people see them in Moscow because you know in every country's capital the mindset is totally different than at the outer parts of the country. It's woke or it's different or how every country has different phenomena going on in the capital but usually the capital mindset is like vastly different from the outskirts of the country, the borderlands which Novosibirsk is. And this guy is very surprised that their Russian uniform in the metro for regular Moscow people is a sign of a murderer. Go away, murderer, you. These Moscow people feel the drone attacks every night. They're perhaps more connected to the war in Ukraine than the borderlands area, which Ukraine simply cannot reach and it's fully under Putin's media space. Moscow has a little bit more freedom in that area. More rich people have 
more freedom of mind. They have money, they have power. So these guys are very surprised with that attitude. Or as it is known, the Moscovites are better than others. So why couldn't I avoid getting drafted? Could run abroad or something. Yes, and this is disgusting. You can already see the Novosibirsk, the very far east city, people having this attitude against Moscow. That, oh, they're better than everybody else. Yeah, I mean, this attitude is also in the Western countries and everywhere. I mean, it's in Estonia also, people living in the country. So I'd have this semi-friendly attitude of, oh, the capital people, they're so like big shots and stuff like that. It's, it's not like we're all in the same country, but you know this division, every country has it. But in Russia, it's bigger because Moscow and the border areas, their wage differences and money and the differences of income are, are several times. We could talk about 10x. 10 times difference. This is not in the Western countries. This is only for Russia. So you have personal experience with this. Certainly, yeah, certainly. You go to the metro and people are staring at you because of the uniform. Again, I did not come voluntarily. I received the paper and come. I didn't run away or hide like you. He's saying the Moscowites hide because they have money and they can go abroad or they can bribe somebody not to go to the army. And the poorer people don't have that option in Russia. I acted like a law-abiding citizen. But when I come on a holiday, they point fingers at me. A holiday, he means he was in Ukraine and they're sent to rest for one or two weeks. So they go to Moscow, of course, to see the big city coming from Siberia. And this is a huge reality check, a huge wake-up check. That the big shots from the capital who have been enduring these drone attacks almost daily for a month don't like them suddenly. Well, it's a wake-up call for Siberian Russians. I know you missed his drunken rambling voice, his clown-like behavior and his face. I mean, look at this guy. Prigozhin has surfaced again two days ago. He released a video claiming he's in Africa. It's a short one. We're gonna watch it. And I hope he's regularly going to post again because I miss the humor. On duty, the temperature is plus 50 Celsius, just the way we like it. Plus 50. Now that's, that's gotta be a lie, I mean, plus 50 is United States Death Valley, that's like 55 degrees Celsius at the highest temperature they have. Wagner PMC is conducting reconnaissance and search operations, making Russia even greater on all continents and Africa even freer. Oh boy, oh my god, this one sentence already, or the clowning has just begun. We'll bring justice and happiness to the African peoples and make life a nightmare for Al-Qaeda and other criminals. We are our only true bagatiris and continue to fulfill the tasks and have been set and that we have made promises to fulfill. Also, I'm not sure about the trigger discipline. Also, the wedding ring is in the finger. Yeah, you can see it, but the trigger discipline, it's like, it's semi on the trigger. Of course, he's kind of in a war zone. I can understand it and he can be forgiven for doing that, but um, I still wouldn't, yeah, it's four points out of 10, I would say. About some time ago, there was a military coup in Niger and the Niger hunter asked Wagner to come to their country and train their troops and, and keep order in the country. Wagner units have also been seen in Mali, Mozambique, Sudan and some more countries. It's good old Russian colonialism because Prigozhin and his troops are very interested in serving these dictators because they have a very specific deal with them. I mean, these countries are very rich with resources, or good old raw resources. These mines are held by local strongmen, usually. They have their own militias. If Wagner troops take these mines for the local dictator or the junta, which is the military leadership of a country, they get to keep 25% of the profits from that mine. 75 goes to the junta, or the leadership of the country. And 25% from any kind of African mine, we're talking potentially billions of United States dollars. And this goes to Wagner, who is directly funded and controlled from Moscow. So this directly goes to Moscow, which is good old fashioned colonialism going on for Russia in Africa. Wagner is the one to do it. You could almost say Wagner is the East India Company of Britain or Dutch, whichever one you want to compare it with. Both of them were big companies at the time. Wagner is doing that for Russia now. So Russia was always late to the colonial game. And now they're doing it 200 years later. It's a big no-no in nowadays world. That's what it is. If you don't agree with me or think anything different, please put it in the comments. I'll read it. I'll respect you for it. Now, my friends, the time has come for me to butcher some new Patreon names. I'm reading them like I would read them as an Estonian man. 
So cover your ears to avoid any ear bleeding. Robert Williams, Pet Sellers, Claude Lalande, Jenny Taylor, Carles Koper. Thank you to these five people for the support. If you like my channel, Patreon link is in the description below. Thank you for coming back, my friends, time and time again. Thank you for watching my videos. And as always, until my next video, which is tomorrow, stay cool and bye-bye.